So what is going on everyone, Fernando Silva here with another video and most people know me as the iPad guy because I do mostly talk about iPad and iPad Pros on this channel, whether it's updates, hardware, accessories, but I have been using this MacBook Air, the M1 version, since it came out in late November of 2020. So I wanted to give you guys my insight on owning this thing for about four to five months now, but then also let you guys know what it's like using the M1 coming from an iPad Pro user's perspective, because everybody knows that the iPad Pro is my main device, which I keep right here. And so far, it's been nothing but amazing, but I wanna to talk to you guys a little bit more about this M1 MacBook and exactly which one I got and how I like it and what I use it for. But without further ado, let's get right into it. So the first thing that we have to talk about is exactly which MacBook Air I actually got. So I have the base model MacBook Air. So I'm talking about base, base, base. And then the way I got it is through the Apple Education Store. So real quick, if you guys don't know this little trick, Apple has their Apple Education Store open to pretty much everybody. You don't need to have the .edu email. You don't need to be a teacher. You don't need to be a TA. You kind of just go in. And I do think it's US specific because some of the people have tried it. But basically they either take $100 off main devices or depending on the promotion, they add in like free AirPods or something like that. So. The MacBook Air that I got, the M1, I got it for $899. It's the eight gigabyte variant in terms of RAM, 256 gigabytes of SSD storage. So the eight core CPU, the seven core GPU, and the 16 core neural engine all up in there. So overall, again, it's the base M1 MacBook Air. And I wanted you guys to know that because I didn't upgrade the RAM, I didn't get any extra storage, I didn't go with the Pro model, I went with the base MacBook Air, which is the one that I recommend to pretty much anybody that is on the market for a basic laptop because this thing is gonna blow you away. So the biggest thing about the M1 Max is just how fast that M1 processor is, especially compared to the Intel counterpart, right? So a lot of people took the 2020 MacBook Air, which I owned, the 2020 Intel MacBook Air I purchased in April of 2020, ended up wasting so much money because four months later, five months later, I purchased the M1 version. But lo and behold, basically what people did was compare the Intel version versus the M1 and the M1 blew everything out of the water. People couldn't believe what the M1 MacBook could do with only eight gigabytes of RAM compared to a fully loaded 15 inch, 16 inch MacBook Pro that's four or $5,000 with 64 gigs of RAM, Intel. It was just, the MacBook Air was just running everything even more smoothly, right? But not everybody's recording in 4K, not everybody's trying to live render, not everybody is, you know, taking 120 megapixel pictures and trying to edit it in Adobe. Most people are just trying to get their work done, right? So I'm gonna walk you guys through my use cases with this MacBook and pretty much if I've had any hiccups. So I'm gonna walk you guys three different use cases of how you know the average person would use it, with each one being a little bit more intensive, right? And then after that, I'll let you guys know if there was any pitfalls or downfalls with each of those categories. So the first one has to be kind of minimal task, right? The minimal task is emails, word processing, watching a video or two on YouTube, uh, having a couple tabs open, you know, in Safari, in Chrome, Nothing too crazy, right? Putting together a word power or putting together a word document for work and things like that. So all those tasks you can run with no issues whatsoever, right? There was no hiccuping, it never slowed down, I never got the spinning wheel of death. And then what I wanna do is kind of move into the more intensive task, right? That middle ground. So I kind of consider this kind of work mode, right? You're still not editing anything in 4K, but you're doing a lot of things at the same time. Maybe you have 20 LinkedIn tabs open, which is something that I usually do at a, in a daily basis. Maybe you have Safari and Chrome open and maybe the Brave browser open. Maybe you have iTunes going on in the background, Spotify, you got a YouTube video playing. And these are all things that the MacBook Air with eight gigs of RAM can handle totally fine. I've been in situations where I have 50 tabs open of LinkedIn and Safari. I have a couple things open on Chrome. I have a video playing in the background. And not only that, I have it sidecarring to my iPad Pro with no issues at all. So again, if you're doing something that's a little bit more intensive, basically doing the, le the lesser intensive task, but a lot more of it, again, you're gonna be totally fine with only eight gigs of RAM. And then when you go into the more intensive tasks, like the 4K editing, like uh, Adobe Premiere, like Photoshop, again, these are all things that Apple somehow has figured out. And again, let me put a little caveat on that, right? If you're in the Apple ecosystem, right? If you use Final Cut Pro, use iMovie, use the iWork suite, all of these things are built by Apple for Apple. This thing is gonna whiz with eight gigabytes of RAM, no issues. Even with Final Cut Pro, which is a very intensive video editor, because it's made by Apple, Apple has optimized it perfectly for the M1 chip, so it's gonna work amazingly on this, no problems whatsoever. Even LumaFusion, which is an iOS and iPad Pro app, renders things in real time with no issues. So 
I'll leave that video down below if you guys want to see that co test comparison between the iPad Pro and the M1 MacBook, because it's pretty impressive what the M1 MacBook can do. But now if we go into the other side of that more intensive task, right? Let's say you're an Adobe Suite user, right? Let's say you use applications that aren't built for the M1. In comes Rosetta 2, changes that up for you, and then all of a sudden your apps are working amazingly, right? And I saw this firsthand because I'm a big Microsoft Office user. Microsoft actually came out and made their main suite applications M1 compatible. So you have PowerPoint, Word, Excel, Outlook, those main applications were all converted to be M1 compatible. But there were still some other applications which Microsoft didn't change over, like OneDrive, like Teams, like OneNote. These are all applications that stayed on the Intel variant, and Apple and the M1 chip, for the most part, took care of those no problem. There were still a couple of syncing issues with OneDrive, but the applications themselves ran perfectly and they ran smoothly. Like it's not, it's not like you're losing frames on an application, it's not stuttering, it's not freezing, everything still works fine. So if you were questioning and worried about those Intel applications, like you have a specific Intel app that hasn't been moved over, the M1 chip in Rosetta 2 will be able to handle that with no issues whatsoever. So those are three different categories of how it would say how the M1 chip really handles, and so far it's been amazing. So I can't complain when it comes to the eight gigs of RAM. Do I wish I went with 16? Sometimes, but it's not because of me losing frames or me losing time and doing a task. It's more so I, I wish I got 16 gigs to future-proof myself maybe a couple years down the line and maybe not have to immediately buy the new M1X MacBook. But again, I do think that eight gigs of RAM will be enough for a few years, especially if you're kind of teetering between that low to middle ground of intensive tasks, right? If you're 4K editing all the time in 60 and you're gonna try to go to 8K in about a year, then maybe you should go 16 gigs just to make sure that, hey, I'm gonna be good in the next two, three, four, five years with this 16 gig MacBook or M1 MacBook Air. And then a lot of other things that people kind of don't talk about with the M1 and the MacBook Air is, because it's kind of an old and outdated design, is the design itself, because the design is still pretty timeless. It's still very pretty, cool to the touch, the aluminum. You do only get two USB-C ports instead of the four with the MacBook Pro, but even the MacBook Pro with the M1 still only gives you two USB-C ports. So keep that in mind, they are Thunderbolt though, which is nice to have. And then on the other side, you get the headphone jack. So overall, in terms of IO, there's really nothing there. You get one port to charge and one port for auxiliary things. That's why I always have to bring a dongle with me or a USB-C hub or have a USB-C dock, which I have right here. So again, the IO isn't great, but the design language is beautiful. And then you have that retina display, which for the most part has worked wonders, right? I haven't had any complaints. So the way I have it set up on my desk is I just have the M1 Mac over here. I have it connected to a USB-C dock by Bridge called the Stone 2, and that outputs to my 1080p ultra wide monitor, and I'm good to go. And that's all I really need. And this, and this thing is powerful and it's hard not to recommend, especially when the alternative is Windows computers, which are gonna be dying a lot quicker, that don't get the security updates that Mac does, and is now still running Intel-based chips, which isn't built by Microsoft. So again, there's gonna be some hiccups along the way. Apple building the M1 chip and transitioning over is one of the smartest things they could ever do, and why not go with the company that's building not only their own hardware, but their own software to work on that hardware the way that company intended it to. So that's my two cents so far. Highly, highly recommended. If you're on the market for a laptop, don't wait for the M1X or the M2, whatever's gonna happen. If you're a student, if you just need a laptop to kind of have on a daily basis that's portable, that's light, that can do everything that you would need it to, the base model MacBook Air from the education store that you can get for $900 is the way to go. I'll link it below. That's gonna do it for this video. Leave some comments below if you guys have any questions to follow up, maybe more specific application questions or specific software questions. Leave them down below. I'll be in the comments for a little while answering those questions. Don't forget to check out channel sponsor Paperlike. They're always keeping us protected on the iPad side. I'm hoping they keep us protected on the MacBook side here soon. But until next time, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. Peace.